Okay, so welcome to this FIR video interview. Uh, this is Neville Hobson in Working Berkshire, England, and we have our co-host, Shell Holtz. I'm here from Concord, California. And uh, we're going to have an interesting conversation with three guests on this uh, Google Plus Hangout video conversation. Uh, Tack Anderson in London, Eric Schwartzman in Los Angeles, and Chris Hewer. Uh, usually in the States, but actually in Chamonix in France. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and we're going to be talking about an event that took place in Paris last week called Le Web. I think it was the fifth uh, annual event uh, that started way back in the early days of social media. And this is now a huge mega tech event that attracts 3,000 or so visitors from around the world, including politicians, uh, major influencers, and all sorts. And the three of you were at that event. Uh, let's uh, have a quick round robin introduction of everyone. And maybe we start with you, Tack. Great, thanks. Um, so, yeah, my name's Tack Anderson. Um, I am the vice president of digital consulting at um, Wagner Edstrom. Um, I recently moved to London, England, uh, which is where I'm coming from today. Uh, from Seattle, Washington. Uh, I've been here for about six months um, on a two-year assignment. And yeah, I love this was my first web and really enjoyed it. Cool. Thank you. Eric, how about you? Well, I'm a, a longtime friend of uh, this podcast. Uh, yeah. I used to do some contributions. I do my own podcast, On the Record Online. I uh, wrote a book recently with Paul Gillen about B2B social media and uh, founded a company called iPressroom, which was the first content management system for PR people, which I sold about 18 months ago uh, to private investors, and now I'm an independent consult. Chris. Cheers, Neville. Thank you very much for having me, both of you. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time hangouter. Uh, <laughs> Chris Fewer. I'm founder of Social Media Club and currently with Deloitte Consulting, and there I'm a post-digital architect working on setting up our next generation uh, social business practice and a bit more than that. And I might add that Chris was also a regular on an FIR uh, feed that we used to do on the social media yeah. news release. That's true. So uh, we should kick off our discussion. We've probably got a lot to get through in, in the next however long it is, maybe half an hour or so perhaps, uh, with, a th with the three of you, all of you were at the Web 11 in Paris. And maybe we, we would start our, our, our discussion, our conversation with some thoughts from you, Eric, as you were the one, you and I were chatting last week about doing this kind of uh, uh, chat on your impressions, your perspectives, thoughts you have about the web. Uh, maybe you can you kick off our conversation, Eric, with some thoughts on the Web 11. Sure. So, you know, the biggest search and social networking companies to date were born in America. So it's easy to be seduced into thinking that the American way of doing things online is the best way of doing things online. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, mes most netizens today are not Americans. Uh, the majority of Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn users are outside the U.S. And in many of those places, commerce is not necessarily the primary objective of business. Um, I, you know, I would even say in some countries, perhaps more mature economies, uh, you know, people who are very ambitious are suspect of somehow undermining the public interest, you know. Um, there was an interesting quote from uh, the guy who runs PATH, who was one of the speakers at the web. He said, you know, a, a revenue is like air. You need it to live, but it's not the purpose for living. And uh, surely you can't deny that in the U.S. there are many corporations that profit at the expense of the greater public interest. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about the web is the ability to maintain some sensitivity to the cultural nuances outside the U.S. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're catering to a global audience, successful online communications requires sensitivity to global cultures. Um, South by Southwest is a great place to get together with the international tech community, but it happens in Austin. So the global perspective is diluted through an American lens. The web, on the other hand, happens every December in Paris, and uh, it showcases the global tech scene through a distinctly European filter, which for me is extremely valuable um, because I live in the U.S. and I look at things through my own lens. Uh, the conference is produced by Luik and Geraldine Lemure. It is, in my opinion, the fastest-paced, most entertaining of the tech conferences. 
Uh, they've got the best food and the highest production value. And they are absolutely packed with news breaks. Um, and so, you know, you get all these timely news breaks, but the bigger, more strategic corporate lessons I got, uh, you know, came from attending a conference in France and experiencing those news breaks among, you know, the European community. Um, you know, the French government has long been regarded as overly bureaucratic, contemptuous of corporate greed, and downright arrogant. Um, and there was a, a bunch of news breaks I noticed uh, about, um, there's an organization called the Authorité de la, Co de la Concurrence, and they were slam they slammed P&G and a bunch of uh, soap companies, huge fines for collusion while I was there. Um, I could not get broadband to save my life while I was there. You have to uh, have a French checking account, and you need to sign a one-year contract, and even then it'll take two to three days to turn it on. Now, had I keeled over of heart failure, they'd rush me right to a hospital and fix me up with no health insurance whatsoever. <laughs> so it's just different priorities, different way of looking things. And for me, you know, the ability to sort of experience that, I think, makes me a more effective communicator. Uh, the web uh, was full of last-minute scheduling changes, uh, but that's just the way they do things there. Uh, you can shut up and wait. We're going to have some great speakers for you, and they'll get here in due time. Uh, Sean Parker was uh, going to show up in the morning at 11 a.m., I think, to speak. At, uh, at the last minute, he rescheduled for 2 p.m. I wound up missing him. Um, but I guess just to wrap up my intro here, I think it's easy to dismiss the French as aloof, but my take is that they just have different priorities, right? You might not be able to get online as easily, but if you have a medical emergency, they'll take care of you. So what is more important, you know, getting online to be able to check Twitter or, um, you know, having having your, your, your medical needs attended to? The biggest tourist destination in France is the Eiffel Tower. If you go to their website, they say they open at 9 a.m., but in fact, they open at 9.30. Uh, you know what? You can shut up and wait. It's a beautiful monument. You'll see it in good time. In front of the Eiffel Tower, they have free toilets, which are self-cleaning. They're self-disinfecting toilets. We would never have that in the States, you know? We need to get people through the toilets quicker and keep those cash registers, you know, chinking. But over there, it's just different priorities. I mean, and quite frankly, I'd rather have disinfected toilets and wait a half an hour than, you know, be moved through quickly and, and you know, get a disease. Excellent. You know, we had a good time there, Eric, by the sounds of it. I think that's terrific. We have, we, we have self-disinfecting toilets in San Francisco, Eric. Oh, you do? Yeah. Fabulous. Where are they? There, there's a YouTube video that uh, made the rounds. I know that David Meerman, Scott, shows it a lot uh, from the uh, company that makes these out of Sweden, I think it is, uh, Complete Washroom Solutions. Uh, and I saw one of those in Belgium when I was there. Great product. Yeah. So the Europeans moved to San Francisco with the self-cleaning toilets. That sounds, like, that sounds pretty good. Silicon Valley is the place for that in that case. We have them in London, too, by the way, in certain places. Uh, but the ones you describe, Eric, sound really something. Um, you know, the, the, just just to uh, just get one more thing in here. One of the keynotes was uh, was Eric Schmidt, and prior to his keynote, he he met with Sarkozy, and um, you know, he said the reason that he went to the web is because he wants to convince all governments everywhere in the world to provide their citizens with stable, reliable uh, broadband, wireless, and stationary access because. People will innovate themselves out of the economic malaise if they can just get access. So, you know, on the one hand, you can see how you know, the sort of French way of doing things protects the public interest. On the other hand, if you overregulate too aggressively, you stymie innovation. And uh, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Hmm. Now, I wonder, uh, turning to you, Tech, um, uh, as an expat American uh, living in London, and you're, you're kind of immersing yourself in, in well, British culture, not European culture. So you, you went to Paris, uh, to Le Web. Uh, we've heard some of Eric's uh, initial impressions uh, from his perspective. I wonder if you could share some thoughts, maybe uh, from your particular point of view as a communicator with, with a big global PR firm, what you saw at Le Web that you think uh, struck you, I mean, particularly from that particular perspective. Share your thinking on that tag. Yeah, so um, so actually I have an interesting, um, I think, 
vantage point in that while I'm based here in London, uh, the, my main job is actually to work with our other offices across EMEA. And so, um, so Europe, um, Africa, uh, some of the Middle East. And so, I've, you know, I've been here about five months, and this was my third trip to Paris. So I've been there quite a bit, um, and and it's really hard to take Eric serious right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice, nice one, Eric. Ha ha ha! May we? I put one of those on, but it wouldn't do any good, right, Chris? <laughs> you wouldn't be able to see it. <laughs> Might cover up some of the gray, you know, that you could get some of that going. Um, so I think for me, you know, the interesting thing for, about the web for me was, um, you know, the, I think that, you know, the French do have different priorities and, um, you know, the way I, to me, the, the, the contrast that I work with a lot, um, I work a lot with our office in Munich and our office in Paris. And um, in Munich and Germany, they're very technical. They really like to understand the inner workings of things. And, and, and the French don't really care how things work. They just, does it make me look good? You know, it's, it's all about presence. It's all about, um, you know, the beauty of things. I think that the French even like the idea of things more than they like the actual product of things. Um, you know, they're a very romantic culture and, um, you know, it's been, it's been really interesting working with them. I think what I saw at Le Web was in, in some ways kind of more of the realization of that. Um, it was, um, I, I had a great time. I, I did a blog post on it and I actually called it the anti South by Southwest. Um, you know, I think it was about with the exception of the, the content or the, um, you know, the, they were both kind of social media startup related. Just about everything was as opposite you could be. It was a lot of black suits. Um, it was, you know, sushi and really small, small sandwiches on really small plates with little tiny cups of coffee. Um, and, you know, it was, there were a lot of, I think, the stereotypical things that we think of French and French culture. But to me, I think what was really interesting was um, how passionate the their startups are there. Um, you know, their entrepreneurs that were there. and. Um, you know, even how advanced their social media is, um, you know, when I came over at least about six months ago, things changed so rapidly, who knows where it's at now, but social media adoption in, in France as a whole is about 40%. Um, and that's, it's way behind, you know, where London or even in the U S. Um, and it's not, it's not for lack of, you know, say, when I, when I work in South Africa, you know, they've got about 10%, 12% internet penetration. So there's a huge infrastructure problem. There's not an infrastructure problem in Paris and France. You know, if, if they wanted to be in social media, they would be, I think, um, I think especially the older generations just don't see the point yet. Um, but it's really strong, um, in the younger generations. And, you know, you mentioned Eric's, Eric Schmidt's, um, talk with Luik and, and the thing that I really liked about his, his talk was that when he met with Sarkozy, you know, he really, Eric really wants to see a, a competitor to Silicon Valley. And I think, you know, um, I think Paris, I think Berlin, I think London, you're starting to see some real serious tech hubs over here um, from a social media and a technology startup standpoint. And I, I, like you mentioned, Eric, I think the interesting thing is that a lot of these startups, they don't come at it from the standpoint of, how can I make a quick buck and get acquired by Google or Facebook or Microsoft or someone? It's, you know, how can I build a really cool company that's going to benefit my community, however they define that. Great. That's an interesting perspective. Uh, turning to you, Chris, um, uh, working for, the, for a big company, uh, likewise, Deloitte, uh, and your perspectives uh, at the web, what, what did you see? Do, do you mirror anything that Tack and Erica said, or have you got something a little different to share? Well, you know, it, it's really rather interesting. Um, this is actually my third web. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be invited over as a blogger once again. In fact, uh, one of the interesting things I noted was actually the, the pre-party. Uh, I was one of four American bloggers uh, invited. And uh, in fact, it's probably just the, the dollar not doing well or something. In the past, there have been quite a number more. Uh, the international contingent was, was very strong this year. Um, and, and of course, just Paris itself has been a, a great hub for Social Media Club. Our Social Media Club Paris brought in Le Monde and Van Kat and, and many of the other major uh, Parisian media players very early uh, who got this, who were involved in new media. Um, really, I, I think the most poignant moments for me was during Karl Lagerfeld's speech. Um, I think the, the fact that he gets it so deeply 
um, and that he still remains his own character, his own sense of his iconic self, uh, is so, so uh, refreshing. Um, the technology is merely a tool to him. Uh, in fact, at one point, he showed off how much of a tool it is. Not only uh, does he have four different iPhones uh, with different codes and, of course, different Carl Lagerfeld iconic images uh, on the cases of each of those iPhones with different numbers on each so he can tell them apart. Um, he also has hundreds and hundreds of iPods uh, and I believe dozens and dozens of iPads. Uh, so he really does have just an immense amount of technology. But at the same time, he can't be bothered with email. He has too much to do. He's too busy creating. He doesn't have time for that sort of thing. I'm going to um, adopt that stance. Yeah, love it. Yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been trying for quite some time, particularly at work, where apparently I have approximately 4,500 emails in my inbox in my first 10 months that have gone unanswered. Um, so th that's a whole other perspective for a different FIR we can talk about at some other point. Um, but moving into um, the other perspective, this was also the first time that Loic and uh, Geraldine brought up a, an Enterprise Day specifically or brought up a specific track around this social enterprise. And, of course, IBM and Salesforce and many other large enterprise companies were there and forced, um, looking to actually get a little bit of that startup spark, I guess you could say, um, but also talking more seriously, trying to get some of these consumer-oriented uh, entrepreneurs to start thinking about the enterprise. And I, and I think that's very important. One of the biggest trends we see and we've been talking about for some time over at Deloitte is the consumerization of IT, um, this app mentality. And, of course, George Colony, the CEO of Forrester, um, brought up this point uh, poignantly throughout his speech, um, talking about the waves of disruption that are happening right now, um, and particularly starting to talk about post-social. And I think that was actually one of the other poignant moments for me because, uh, well, of course, I'm, I'm very much into social media, and I, I believe it's an important um, movement that, that's changed society in many ways. Um, I think calling it post-social in that way is in many ways giving it too much weight. Um, we've been talking at Deloitte about post-digital uh, for some time, and the fact that you know we are now dealing with this post-digital era where we have to look at not having language that accurately describes the confluence of different trends and disruptions that are happening now, that are happening out of cloud. And, of course, the, the, the conference trends themselves that were brought out, social, local, mobile. Um, but it's more than that. It's big data. It's analytics. It's actually about the change in society and the, the change in behaviors and psychology of mass society as a result of being connected in the way that it is now, of having this real-time access to data and having this expectation of transparency this expectation of, of honesty and accuracy of information and the ability to correct that is changing the way people behave and think, changing the way that organizations need to structure themselves to meet the market today. And so when we start looking at all these different characteristics of the post-digital era, um, it requires in many cases a fundamental rebuilding of the organization from the ground up on out to the market and back, to, back again. And so um, I think that we saw many of, the, of these trends actually you know, really solidified and, and driven home, um, moving out of the startup space um, or into kind of the economic space of it all. Um, one of the things that I've been talking about a lot that I heard four different people mention, including Sean Parker, when he finally got up on stage uh, after a really long night the night before, um, was actually uh, the idea of collaborative consumption. And I think that, that this is really important. It's not just the Spotify and the social sharing of music and the things that are happening there, um, but it's also what's happening in terms of commerce, and it'll ultimately uh, impact, I believe, manufacturing in a very serious way. Of course, we have relay rides in the States. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, what it is is essentially I can rent you my car. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer car rental service. Um, of course, Airbnb also falls in this space. And a good friend of ours, Mickey Krimmel, has started something called Neighbor Goods, um, which is the idea that if I have something in my garage, like let's say a, a chainsaw, I could list it on the site and actually offer it up to others in my neighborhood to rent for me from a few dollars. I mean, why do I need to go out and buy a brand new chainsaw? The thing is, is, is a chainsaw, if I could just go down the street and borrow one from a friend and for five bucks uh -oh. and have access to this. But it was really great to see the collaborative consumption coming up here at LeWeb. And, and it's certainly a trend that I've been watching as I think it's going to affect every major company uh, across the economy around the world, regardless of culture.
Yeah, I saw a service, uh, or I heard about it, where uh, I think it's for couch surfing, uh, to find a couch to crash on in somebody's place. Uh, Social media, uh, one of the shows on Leo Laporte's network. But I read some uh, reports of um, George Colony's talk, and in this, what he referred to as the post-social era, he said there's going to be a consolidation and a lot of startups are are going to fall by the wayside as we uh, get down to a few because people just don't have the attention span and the bandwidth to assimilate a lot of these. And what I was hearing from you guys is that there's a different mentality outside of the United States that says it doesn't have to make money, um, possibly doesn't even have to attract a huge audience as long as it serves a community. Did you see a disconnect between what Colony was saying and maybe what some of the other American speakers were saying uh, and, and the European or non-North American participants, attendees at, at the conference? Well, I think there was a great example of that, um, and maybe some of the other guys. I think the name of the company was called Badu. Um, it was uh, started by a, um, a Russian guy that now lives in London, and it started off as a social network, you know, much like, you know, this was back many years ago, like a MySpace or Facebook or something else, but it's it's basically morphed in, um, it has a geolocation aspect to it, so you can, it's a way to meet people, and he got the idea when he went to one of these um, bars where you and your friends go to the bars, and you're, you sit around these little tables, and the table has a big number on it, and it has a phone on it. And you can call the people at the other table and talk to them before you actually go over and meet them. So you got the you basically build an app that does that. So you can log in, um, and I mean, it, you can see who's in your general vicinity. You can ping them, have an IM chat, agree to meet up. Um, I forget he's got something like six million users on it, or maybe more. One hundred fifty um, million users. One hundred fifty million. He made six million dollars last year in profit. <laughs> he made. I think six million was the profit that he made last year, um, and one hundred fifty million users. And he hasn't even launched in the U.S. yet. Um, he's raised something like um, Chris. I don't know if you remember the exact number. Something like forty thousand dollars or something. Oh, it no. wasn't a. Whole, how much did he raise? Forty million. He, he raised about forty million, and he was profitable his first year. Or, or actually, he might have raised six million. I don't know. We'll check up the facts. Yeah, uh, I didn't think I didn't think it was that extremely much. Extremely successful. Extremely yeah. profitable. Has you know, basically, Luik was like, "Well, what's next?" And he's like, "I don't know. Keep building this out." Like, you know, he's. I I got the impression that his funding came more not from uh, institutionalized VCs. Um, you know, probably from Russian money or something, um, since that's where he started it, but. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't seem like he's in a hurry to sell or get acquired or do anything else. And, and when you think about, you know, especially when you start thinking about the developing country, and, and like I said, I do a lot of work in, in South Africa where mobile's huge. Um, I have a counterpart where we talk a lot about the work that he's doing in Asia. And, you know, you can have, you know, a user base of tens of millions of people, and that's a drop in the bucket. And if you can have you can have a very very profitable company with very low operating costs with tens of millions of people, who cares if there's fifty of them or a hundred of those competitors? You can there is still enough market for everyone. So I think that I think that the American mentality is yes, b- business maturity model. There will be two to three big players and you know a couple small feeder fish down there. Um, but that's when you're used to dealing with a market the size of the U.S. When you're talking about a global population, when there are, you know, five billion phones in the world and, and you know, and counting and growing, um, who says there can only be two or three? Yeah, just to add something to that, uh, there was a company mentioned on stage called The Man Pack. And The Man Pack is a subscription service where you pay a certain amount of money a year if you're a man, and they send you monthly socks and underwear. Now, I would imagine that you guys aren't too excited about going to buy socks and underwear anytime soon. I mean, it's you have to do it, or if you're lucky, your wife does it for you and throws away, throws them away when they get dirty, right? Um, but I mean, what a great service! I mean, is it social? No. But Dave McClure, the venture capitalist of 500 Startups, uh, was on stage, and he said, you know, it's less expensive than ever to access global markets. The cost of doing business just keeps coming down, and the size of the market just keeps expanding. So I think, you know, the number of startups that are going to get out there and, you know, catch the wind and, and just sail off into the sunset 
I don't even think we've seen the beginning of it. Um, may, they may not be social networks, but I think, you know, the opportunities abound. Yeah, it's interesting, Eric. Well, one comment I've seen uh, a lot here in the UK in the mainstream media uh, of journalists who are at the web is exactly on that point, that it seemed to serve as a, a showcase to uh, 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 portray European startups in particular in ways that don't normally happen, bring them to the attention of people like the journalists in the mainstream media who then write about it in the mainstream media to bring it to the attention of the mainstream reader outside of the tech bubble. And I think, okay, is that a big deal? Well, maybe it is over here because the startup scene uh, in the UK certainly, and I suspect elsewhere in continental Europe, is nowhere like it is in the US in terms of visibility, in terms of you know, every day there's 10 people starting a business of some kind. That doesn't happen here because the environment's different. So maybe the web may uh, catalyze that, certainly in ways that haven't been done before. I mean, would, would that seem a reasonable supposition to you from what you saw when you were there? You know, I, I, I did sort of off stage wind up bumping into a lot of startups uh, coming out of, uh, you know, outside of the U.S., but the reality is, I mean, if you looked at most of the presenters on stage, most of them were American companies. Right. Um, you know, I would have loved to have seen Etsy there. You know, they weren't there. I would have loved to have seen SoundCloud there. They weren't there. Were people talking about Berlin? Sure. Uh, were they talking about, uh, you know, startups coming out of Latin America? Sure. There was actually a presenter on that subject. But, I mean, if you just did the simple math, most of the presenters on the main stage were Americans. Yeah, but but Eric, I, I don't think, look, there, there's over 3,000 people there. I, I don't think you had a chance to meet everyone. Well, I'm just talking about what years, happened I, on stage. I'm just saying yeah, about but what... Yeah, that's always the case. That's always stage. been the case. They always put that on stage. You weren't in the other room where all they really had was startups from across Europe presenting in the startup competition, right? So if you spent more time over there, that's all you would have seen. Right. So what Perhaps. I was saying is because they had multiple stages, because... They're investing, their economic development board is, is investing to that level. You know, you see them in Silicon Valley at different events. You see them in South by Southwest. You see them everywhere. Of course, you see UK, Ireland there as well. And, and you don't see France so much, but, you know, Paris is starting to get that up. I think the most amazing thing is actually how many deals get done at the web because of the gravity of the event, that it pulls so many people together for it. You know, there was uh, the CEO of Evernote talking about a deal he started working on last year with Orange that they announced and, and worked out a new deal um, just this year. So, you know, whether it's big companies doing business with startups or, or people meeting one another to create new startups, um, I don't have all those stories, but I know anecdotally from talking to others that a lot of startups have come from the web and, and from right. the chance to meet there and have that energy and meet investors. It was interesting when the um, CEO of PATH presented and he was talking to uh, Mick Sigler about, the, you know, Sweden. And basically what they said was that easy, cheap access to the Internet in Sweden led to a number of breakthrough technologies, you know, you know, the, the first of which were these nascent peer-to-peer -peer networks, which ultimately, you know, were piracy, but which I used to Skype, and now we see, you know, PATH coming out, out of that part of the world. And so here's is a country that, you know, made it a, they made it their business to give everyone access to easy, cheap, reliable, fast broadband, and sure enough, you know, people innovated. And hey, Eric, I think I, you're know, thinking of Spotify. I think that was Spotify. Pat's out of Silicon Valley. Dave, Dave Morin from from Facebook okay. actually started Pat. So yeah, you're thinking okay. of Spotify. So so thank you, thank you for for correcting me on that. Um, and the same thing now is what's happening in Berlin, right? They've got the infrastructure there. They've got you know low cost labor. I talked to a, a buddy of mine, uh, a woman who worked at a she worked for Current TV in in Rome. And uh, Berlusconi pretty much shut down Current TV in Rome, and she's moving off to Berlin to join a startup there. I mean, that is definitely the hot market. But I mean, from my vantage point, you know, and I was Chris mostly at the in the main room at the main stage. You know, most of what I saw there was you know Facebook and Google and you know the, the big titans of industry. 
That's funny. I want to come back to Shell's original question, though, if I may, because jo George Colony did hit upon, I think, some very strong points, and I think he also missed the mark on a few things, and, and I'd love to have a chance to actually talk to him more. In fact, I tried to, and just couldn't get time with him. But what he was talking about was that, w that we are running out of time that we are so busy that we're about to enter a time deficit and that because of this, we don't have any more time to waste on, you know, casual games and, and virtual goods and, and all these other things. But, but I think that's skewed in the same way that VC's views of the world have been skewed on every new wave that comes around. Because I see again and again more of these apps, more of these, these networks and things that are all about just hanging out because we've gotten to the point as a society that we don't need to build the shelter over our heads. We don't need to hunt our food. We don't need to garden our food. And that more and more people have all this excess time, and that's why it's there. But what he's hit upon is that in the corporate world, we're, we're busy taking care of clients, taking care of managing hundreds of people, taking care of a life where we want to be at home with our families or enjoying our hobbies and our leisures. There isn't enough time. And so there isn't enough time to fit social in. And I think there's some interesting things in there, but I think he, he kind of missed it a little bit with that one. Well, I think you have to look at, too, what are, what are the things that we're really giving up? I mean, you'd mentioned, you sound like you're about in the same boat I am with, with several hundred unread email, um, let alone the ones that I haven't responded to. Um, you know, I don't respond to all my email. I don't even, you know, I, I literally archive them weekly. I just drag and drop. And, you know, my, my Outlook has a search function that actually works really well. If there's something I need to go back and find, it's in there somewhere. Um, you know, I, I've watched my own patterns shift over the last, you know, several years. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the things that don't add value to my life that I'm giving up. Um, you know, and it's, so it's things like, you know, I get just on my work email, not even counting, you know, my personal email, I get two to 300 email a day. I don't read them all. I don't, definitely don't reply to all of them. Um, you know, I, I do reply to almost all of my tweets though. You know, all my replies that people send me, I reply to the, you know, cause to me that's a higher value than, you know, yet one more email distribution list that I'm on. So, um, you know, I think that it's, I think, no, there isn't any more time if we keep doing the same things we've always done, which we're not going to. Uh, that's a, a good point, uh, uh, Tack. And in fact, that, I think that probably leads us to, as we get to the to the conclusion of our conversation uh, uh, from a time point of view today, I wanted to ask you, uh, thinking about everything you've said and those perspectives you, each of you has offered from your personal uh, memories and, and thoughts from being at the web, what about... Uh, what's coming? What What do you think? Uh, and I'm thinking really the listeners to this podcast, what what should they be paying attention to? What do you see coming out of the web that indicates to you trends, let's say, in a very broad sense that we ought to be paying attention to? What, what's on the horizon for communicators in particular, but for any of us in business, such as the listeners to this podcast? What do you say? Tack, what, what, what would you say to that one? Um, well, you know, no, get, going back to the communication marketing side of things, um, you know, Chris had mentioned the uh, the social enterprise track that they had um, on the the last day, um, and I, I sat through a good portion of that. And I did I did find it ironic. One of the last sessions there was a there were three people on the panel: um, someone from Disneyland Paris, someone from Red Bull France, um, and someone from Air France. Um, and it was being moderated by a French blogger, and so we had four French people all speaking in English. Um, at, in a French conference. I, I found the irony there. Um, but I was grateful that they did because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to understand them. Um, but the thing that, that jumped out to me was how, you know, and granted, they all work for really big brands, um, but how advanced their social media efforts were, you know. And to me, the thing that I took out of that whole track was that, you know, there there isn't anything new from the standpoint of, you know, from a marketing standpoint of, oh, this new, you know, like it was two, three years ago when we were in this space where, you know, every other day there was something new you had to try and test and, um, and play with. Now it's all about optimization, I think, from a marketing standpoint. It, it's, you know, so now that you've got all of these people on Facebook that are following your brand, you know, what the hell are you going to do with them? Now that you, you know, you're interacting with people on Twitter, you're doing contests, you've, you know, you're optimizing for your hashtags, you're doing those things. But I think it's, you know, we're, we're following the, the typical, um, I think, uh, 
maturity model of, you know, we've gone from the early stages and, and now we're getting into the quantifiably measured and, you know, the same thing CRM did and ERP did and every other business practice. Um, but I think what's, I think from a marketing standpoint, it's just going to continue to mature and focus on optimizing. Um, but I think where, where companies still have really yet to hit on um, is their own internal use, the internal communication, the internal collaboration. Um, and from a global perspective, if, if you're like me and you work from a, for, with a global company, um, you know, the ability to collaborate with people in multiple time zones and share um, cross silos, I think is a really untapped potential right now. Great. Eric, your thoughts? I agree with the organizers. I think they hit it right on the head with their theme. I think the future is social, local, mo and mobile. Um, Google's presence there and the amount of um, you know, marketing muscle that they're putting behind Google Plus uh, just shows you that you know we have moved from a web of pages to a web of posts. And if they can't start to collect social signals to you know reorganize their ranking based on you know what people are plus wanting rather than what they're linking to, um, you know, they're gonna they're not gonna have good information anymore. Uh, on the local side, we saw some apps there, the most interesting of which was one called TaskRabbit that allows you to essentially through a mobile app um, pick up someone's dry cleaning or find someone to pick up your dry cleaning and uh, compensate them, you know, local. And then on the mobile side, uh, you know, there were a lot of different speakers talking about, you know, the future of mobile. Will it be apps? Will it be HTML5? It was interesting to hear the guys at PATH uh, you know, firmly advocating apps over HTML5 and at the same time to hear uh, Facebook double down on HTML5 is the future. I mean, they're just going to go straight to that. Even if the BRIC nations can't support it today, they're building for the future. They're building for tomorrow. And so I think, you know, the future from a communication standpoint, too, is, you know, how are you going to somehow communicate, uh, you know, via social on a lo in local markets and via mobile devices? Chris, final words from you. Oh, um, tough to follow here, but um, I want to go into the enterprise side again because that's where I've been spending a lot of time lately. Uh, in fact, uh, just about a month ago now, a little bit less, um, we just launched uh, Yammer uh, across our entire global organization. I'm rolling out upwards, hopefully, to 180,000 plus people at Deloitte. Um, and, you know, I'm collaborating with people in, 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 well, all over the world right now. In Switzerland, actually, I'll be heading to Geneva in a couple of days and visiting some people in the office there. Um, but I, I think that this post-digital era that we've been looking at, that cross-boundary collaboration is key. Um, but th there's a more fundamental thing happening here that's finally being realized and coming to the surface. And something we've talked about together, well, the, the, at least Neville and Shell and I, for the last several years. Um, and I think it can be best be summed up by the fact that corporations may not be people, but they're made up of people. And in a connected society, the point of connections are those people. So the companies that are best able to tap into the passions of their people and align them with the interests of the organizations and the interests of the markets they serve and, and unleash them are going to be the most successful. And in fact, JP Ragaswamy, uh, chief scientist now at Salesforce, um, brought this up and was talking about the consciousness and what the great force of a consciousness of a global workforce can provide if it can be harnessed and unleashed and orchestrated in such a way for collective purpose. And I think that's that's the new opportunity, and that's the direction that smart, um, awake companies are actually pursuing now. And I think it's really talking to this self-actualization of the corporation and what's possible now because we're able to look beyond the silo walls to see the true potential. And I've been talking a lot lately about the idea of getting beyond the MBO, the management by objective, and moving to... Well, CTO may not be the final title, but the idea about collaborating to outcomes. How do we actually not think about our individual objectives that are going to get our performance metrics hit, that are going to give us that individual raise, but the outcome that is benefiting the entire company, enabling us to create shared value as an organization, not only across these silos internally, but across our ecosystem and out into our 
customer and into the market itself and using these tools to connect. And I think when we're talking about social, that's really what we're talking about. The ability to connect people for common purpose and the tools are just now starting to really arrive to enable us to do this. Brilliant. I just want to thank all of you, Chris Hewer, Eric Schwartz, and Tag Anderson. Thanks very much for joining us on this FIR video, Google Plus Hangouts. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, guys. See you guys. Bye.